Today, we're delighted to have Sebastian de Grave here from uh, KEF. Um, Sebastian studied uh, doing an MSc Acoustics at Le Mans um, and then did a PhD in acoustic metamaterials. So he's, he's probably the ideal person to speak on the LS50 meta. I must I must confess to being a bit of a, a metamaterial sceptic. Uh, Tre Trevor Cox always tells me that meta is a buzzword and that I should uh, think of projects that include the word meta. And I've always I've always been a bit of a sceptic. I always felt a bit like uh, meta materials was something that probably only worked at one frequency or a bit of a, you know, a, a, an an outlier or something. So it's uh, so 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 this is this has changed my opinion. So it's to see to see a device that works broadband uh, and has been, you know, literally makes a measurable, tangible improvement uh, will learn me a thing or two. So uh, we're very pleased to have you here and, and um, yes, delighted to hear what you have to say. So thank you, John, for the introduction. So today I'm going to present the LS50 Meta uh, the genesis and the development and uh, this is uh, my outline for today so the part one is uh, from the ls35a to the kef ls50 because kef uh, ls50 is largely uh, inspired by uh, the legendary s35a and then the part two is uh, from the kef ls50 how did we improve it to create the LS50 meta? And then finally, the meta material absorption technology, which is uh, basically why we have the name meta in the KEF LS50 meta. So let's crack on with the part one. And what about the, what, what is the LS35A? It, it is a lot speaker designed by engineers for engineers. What I mean by this is, there was no marketing consideration. It was just uh, a loudspeaker that should should work well. And the target was um, to create a mini monitor for BBC vans. And the uh, target frequency response was a flat uh, frequency response from 400 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And it sounds weird, 400 hertz is quite high in frequency. so. If you look at this hardwood uh, paper from 1976, uh, we can see that actually it's quite flat uh, below maybe 100 or 80 hertz. And it's reasonably good on axis, so zero degree is quite flat, up to 20 kilohertz, 15 kilohertz. And uh, the, with the angle is also quite good. So 30 degrees, 45 degrees, we can see just a small dip in this area, but it's pretty good. And uh, so in a nutshell, it's a two-way speaker, closed box, so it's not bass reflex. Uh, it features a KEF tweeter and a KEF midrange. And the box construction is made with 12 uh, mil birch plywood and bituminous damping material and we we know this from uh, the secondary uh, hardwood paper in 1977 where we can see uh, a photo of uh, this construction uh, tested so we have a clamp clamp uh, situation it's well known uh, where well, we know the analytical solution for this we we have the plywood and we have the bituminous uh, damping material on it, a shaker and an accelerometer. And from this, we can know uh, what is uh, the resonance of this structure and the damping. We can see around the Twitter the felt uh, in an attempt to reduce the diffraction. And uh, we can see that it's, uh, there is a removable front baffle because it's not very nice, so we can protect uh, the drivers. And uh, finally, it's uh, it's a tiny speaker uh, in certain centimeters. You see, it's only 31 centimeters, only five liters. That's very very small. So it's a it is a mini monitor. And now the KEF 
LS50. So, uh, KEF was founded in 1961. So, 50 years later, uh, we want to celebrate, of course. So, originally, the idea was to take the LS35A and just to have a retro speaker in exactly the same style. So, same box, same uh, size, uh, with felt again around the driver and a removable baffle. But quickly we realized that um, uh, it's a shame not to use 35 years of experience that was uh, gained since the S35A launch. So, especially because you have UniQ. Uh, if you see in a classic arrangement, we have the Twitter mounted uh, on top of the mid-range. They are not coaxial. But the UniQ is in the heart of every speaker, every KEF speaker since 1988. So you can see uh, this is a KEF C35, and it was uh, the first KEF UniQ speaker. And the Twitter is mounted in the center of the mid range. So it is what we call a coaxial driver, and it avoids the interference issue. So that's an example. You can see why it's beneficial to have a coaxial driver. On the left hand side, it's a classic arrangement and on the right hand side, the coaxial driver. So if it's not coaxial, we have an interference uh, between the two drivers. And uh, we can see clearly we, we don't have a, a nice spherical wave. And in the end, what we have is an unbalanced sound in the room. Uh, we'll come back to, to this in a minute, uh, how the speaker interacts with the room. And so it means also that the sound change depending on the direction. And for this, we should be exactly aligned to, to, to work quite well. But as long as we are not, well, you understand, it doesn't work very well. But if it's coaxial, uh, the interference problem is eliminated. And in that case, it's good for multiple listeners because we don't have to be exactly in the center and better room interaction and of axis listening because sometimes we're not exactly aligned. We're doing something else and we're not aligned. So now the question is why KF UniQ is not another uh, coaxial driver, because there are a lot of manufacturers. If it's true that uh, the early uh, UniQ design was very basic, we've continued to try and perfect the concept. And now we have new tools, so we can have a computer simulation. And each time we have a, a, a new UniQ, we are looking at the new improvements. So now we are at the generation 12. And in the end, we gain uh, 30 years, 30 years of UniQ development. That's why it's, it's, a, it's not another new coaxial driver. To give you an example, um, this is a Twitter on the left hand side that is mounted directly on an infinite plane. If we apply an, a pulse, uh, on it, what we see is even if we can see quite a nice pulse on axis, we have an interference off axis uh, and it creates uh, lobings. So when, when we think that uh, a Twitter directly on infinite plane is the ideal situation, actually it's not. We can't create a nice spherical front. And the wave front uh, on the, the right hand side is very nice if we have uh, an optimized waveguide to just to make sure we create this very nice wave front and then it propagates very nicely. It doesn't make any sense to have a very nice waveguide if we don't have a good source. So the source is uh, the Twitter and this is the dome. So we have a, a dome and then so the, we can see the dome here. And inside 
uh, around the dome, we have a, a small triangular shape. And this creates a, a very strong, uh, strong shape exactly where we have the bend of uh, this structure. So you can see uh, at seven kilohertz, we have uh, a pistonic behavior. So it means we have uh, exactly what we want, a rigid piston, it's ideal situation. But at 45 kilohertz, we can see the, how it deforms. And this is, um, uh, this is a, a mode of the overall structure. So with this assembly, we are rigid up to 40 kilohertz. And it's about 10 kilohertz higher than most. And it is simple. It is, uh, and, and it works very well, and it's very light. That's another consideration in this Unicube. If we have a, a very good Twitter, and then a good horn, we can have a problem with the half roll, the classic half roll surround, surround we have uh, in classic drivers. So you can see when we have the pulse, there is a secondary pulse generated by this half roll. If we see it again, secondary pulse. And in the end, we have two pulses, at least uh, on axis. But if we can have something very smooth, like this uh, Z-flex surround, we have in UniQ, we don't see this secondary pulse. We still have a very nice spherical uh, wavefront. And now the tangerine waveguide. So this is this uh, uh, very nice grill in front of the Twitter. Uh, the idea is uh, it's basically a transformer. Uh, the, the Twitter displacement is axial. So this is a profile of the velocity. But if we want to create a perfect spherical front, uh, we need a pulsating sphere. And basically this grill is, uh, is just transforming uh, one direction into a spherical direction. So we have a very nice point source. It improves directivity, a bit of sensitivity also. And that's a bonus, it protects uh, the Twitter dome. 40 microns is very, very thin. So you can see all the details of this in uh, Jack Oakley Brown's thesis. Uh, it's very detailed, very comprehensive and well written. And now uh, the decoupler between the former and the diaphragm. Now we are with uh, around, uh, this is the mid-range now. So this is the diaphragm of the mid-range. And this is a voice coil of this mid-range. And the former is this piece, uh, this cylinder that connects the voice coil to the diaphragm. What, what, what we want at KEF is always have a rigid diaphragm as rigid as possible because it's an ideal piston. However, we have to control the breakup because we can have a ringing at higher frequency. And that's why we have a rubber decoupler between the former and the diaphragm. And this is the response, the frequency response, so the sound pressure versus frequency. Uh, when there is no decoupler, there is a, a strong resonance at 5.5 kilohertz. But with the decoupler, we can't, we don't excite actually this resonance because this uh, mechanism is basically a low pass filter mechanical. So it works well. Th this is an actual measurement. So now how do we hear uh, sound in real room? Uh, the direct sound is the sound directly uh, from the speakers. Uh, but of course there is an interaction with the room and we have early reflections and this will create uh, all the sound. So sometimes uh, we are in the situation where 
direct sound is maybe only 20% of the sound perceived. Uh, and then the rest is reflection. So it's very, very important not to have only a good behavior on axis, but also in every direction. And that's why at KEF, we work, uh, when we develop a, a new product, we take care to work on a sphere and we have a good performance in every direction. So this is a classic box. So we have, uh, it's like a shoe box, uh, like LS35A. And when the sound is radiated from the front, what you can see is a scattering uh, due to the shape of the box, sharp corners. What we have with the LS50 is a curved front baffle. And you can see we, we don't uh, notice a strong scattering on the other direction. So this will not color the sound in the room. Uh, the curve uh, baffle is, uh, this, this is from the, the work from uh, Olson in the 50s, saying that uh, if it's rounded, if it's spherical shape, uh, we don't really see the scattering. Uh, but what we noticed uh, is we don't have a need to have a sphere, just the front baffle is sufficient if it's curved to have a very good behavior in every direction. And now, how do we tackle the problem of uh, the wall vibration of the enclosure? So you can see in black, this is the pressure uh, of the driver itself. And in blue, this is the vibration, so the pressure generated by the vibration of the enclosure. It's well below, but at a certain frequency, it resonates and we can hear strongly the cabinet vibrating. So if we add a brace like in green, you can see here, uh, it stiffens the box. So we push to higher frequencies, but we can see that we don't damp the resonance. And that's the reason why at KEF, we use a viscoelectric elastic material between the brace and the box. And that's the effect we just suppress the peak. And we have now 30 dB between uh, the, the driver, the sound generated by the driver and the box, which is a lot. To compare with LS35A uh, approach, it's only 10 dB when we have a bituminous material directly attached to a, a plywood. So it's a good improvement. This is a way to visualize it. So if we have uh, in a classic box, the driver moving, we have uh, action and reaction. So that will move the rest of the box. And in the LS50, we can see it's completely inert. It's very rigid. Of course, it's exaggerated normally. Uh, it's about one millimeter, the maximum displacement of a mid-range. So now five centimeters is just to visualize the uh, deformation. We can measure it actually, because it's good to have a, a theory and it's good to have simulation, but in the end, we should be able to measure everything. So if we use uh, the laser uh, Doppler vibrometer, which consists uh, basically in having a laser and we split the laser into two parts and one, and then we can have uh, the, the, the two parts reaching the sample that is vibrating. And this interference is detected and we see directly the displacement. It's a measurement of displacement without having a contact. So this is the kind of result we can have. Uh, this is a cumulative spectral decay. So one axis is uh, uh, the displacement in dB, the frequency and the third axis is in time. So the response to a pulse immediately shows two strong resonances. They are very strong and 
uh, we can see the decay, so they are not very damped. So they, it's like a it's like a bell; it will ring for a long time. That's budget, so that's classic, uh, inexpensive speaker. But you can see that with LS35A, it's much better. We don't have these strong peaks, and it's quite well damped. We still have a small residue at higher frequencies. So, but with this measurement, we see that it's already an improvement. And this is now the LS50. So there is no peak at all, and it's immediately damped, and there is nothing in very high frequency uh, where the ear is the most sensitive. So it works well. Now the port location. So this is a port, and uh, the idea of the port is just to extend uh, the frequency response in the low frequencies. And this is a simulation of the acoustics inside uh, the, the speaker. And basically we can just think that an enclosure is like a, it's like a three pipes. And we have, uh, and you, as you can see, the pressure uh, on the wall and a uh, second wall uh, that is in front of it, you have maximum pressure and you have a first mode in this direction and also in the other direction and the third direction. So by placing the driver exactly in the center of this front panel, we don't excite the first mode in the two directions. We are exactly at this anti-node zero pressure. That's beneficial. And then for the port, we use the second mode. So the second mode, the zero is at a quarter of the height. So the port here is located at a quarter of the height and a quarter from this wall in this direction. And in the depth, it's half. So this is the first mode in the depth direction. And in that case, uh, it's not possible to, uh, to excite the very low frequency modes. And you can see the difference here. Uh, in red, this is the overall response, and in blue, just the port. If it's not properly uh, located, we can see clearly the resonances, and it will affect the response. But if it's properly located, uh, we don't, it's negligible. And now, what about the standing wave in the port itself? Uh, normally, a port is just uh, a mass. It's a mass of air in the port, and we have uh, the compliance of the box, and it will resonate at a certain frequency. And what we want is a single resonance to increase uh, the base output. But if we have rigid walls for this port, we have a strong resonance inside. However, if we put a piece of rubber where we have the maximum pressure in the center of the port, you can see the effect. You can see the colors when it's rigid walls, high pressure, low pressure, and you see it's almost zero everywhere. When we have flexible walls, it's just the mass. There is no gradient of pressure. And this is a measurement. So we have what we want the strong resonance, but we suppress the uh, standing waves inside the port by using this rubber. So uh, 20 dB, that's, that's quite good. And this is now when we have uh, the, the problem with the flow. If we have a poorly designed port with sharp corners, what we can see is as the air moves inside, we create turbulences at the corners. And this creates a noise, noise of jet. Uh, so of course, it's not, it's far from ideal situation of just a mass moving. But if it's well designed, when the curvature is properly calculated, as you can see, uh, the turbulence is almost negligible 
and we can't hear the, the sound uh, related to these turbulences. So this is uh, time to conclude the LS50 part. So thanks to this uh, engineering approach, uh, the LS50 has been a huge success all over the world and is commercially one of the best seller in CAF's history. And you can see here a non-exhaustive list of awards uh, we had all over the world. So this is now the part two, the development of the LS50 meta. So a new LS50, the problem is uh, the CAF LS50 is a masterpiece. It works very well. So we keep, we keep the core features, the low diffraction curve baffle, the bracing, it works very well. The flexible port, we keep it. And the unique U core features, tangerine waveguide, the surround to avoid scattering, and uh, base mid-range decoupler and the rigid Twitter. These are the core values that we keep and we change everything else and we add new technologies. But the first question is why meta? So it's meta material absorption technology. In a nutshell, it absorbs 99% of the unwanted wave coming out of the back of the Twitter. So when the Twitter radiates sound in front, it radiates exact amount of sound to the back. So basically we have a, a wanted wave and an unwanted wave, and we want to absorb everything that is in this direction. That's why we have metamaterial absorber here. And to make sure we absorb a maximum amount, we had to increase the diameter of this rear tube. So this is the LS50, 12 mil. But the LS50 meta, it's increased from 12 to 19 mil, which is a lot because uh, the, the, the diameter of the dome is 25 mil. So that's huge. And in acoustics, what matters is the surface area. So it's 2.5 times larger. That's a lot. So we can drop the pressure and maximize the transfer of energy from the dome to the metamaterial absorber. But there are also other benefits of increasing this diameter. And for this, we, we know we have to come back to uh, what is uh, an electrodynamic driver. So the motors are the magnet. This is the Twitter and this is the mid-range. And to guide the flux coming from the magnet, we need a top plate and we need a T-yoke, which is basically a pole and a bottom plate. And between the two, there is a small gap where we have the maximum flux concentration. This is B, this is flux density. And you can see the coil here, and there is a second coil. When a current is in this coil, orthogonally to this uh, flux density, we can generate a force. This is how it works. This is how we create sound. And this is a very simple equation. The force is equal to B, flux density, multiplied by the length of the wire multiplied by the current. Sound is proportional to the current. So from this equation, a necessary but not sufficient condition to have no distortion is to have this proportionality and B should be constant. However, a voice call is a solenoid. So each time we have an increment of current, we create a small dB, a small oscillation 
of the flux density. And what, what we can see is uh, it will affect the B, and in the end, we don't have F equal B L I, but we have F equal B plus D B L I. What it means is it's nonlinear, and this creates distortion. So we can see that the inductance L should be minimized to reduce distortion. If you remember a solenoid, you have n turns, and you have the length of the solenoid, and A is a surface area. This is the definition of the inductance, and mu is the permeability. So if we want to reduce uh, this in inductance, we need to minimize mu, the permeability, which is the gradient of the B field and the H field. So this is the result we have with the Twitter. This is the, the LS50 Twitter uh, motor system, and this is LS50 Meta uh, motor system. So the, there is a magnet, and the plate and a T yoke are made of steel 1010. And this is the characteristic we have with this. So for an excitation uh, H, we have a certain amount of flux density. So at any point in this motor system, we have an operating point. And it will react to the voice call excitation to create this flux modulation because at this point, you have a small modulation, and this is a slope we can see. So we can see immediately with this curve that it's better to be there, because for the same excitation from the coil, we have a very small flux modulation. So what is what, what's the figure of merit? It is basically just the slope. So this is the incremental permeability and it tends to mu zero which is permeability of vacuum so if we are if mu are uh, incremental reach one or tends to run this is beneficial and it see this is exactly what we see here this is the incremental mu if we tend to one if we're close to the dark blue, we are very uh, immune to the voice call uh, uh, flux. So you see, it's, it's quite good with LS50, but it's really, really good with LS50 meta because there is a sm just a small amount of material. We had to extend this uh, diameter. That's the reason. And it's completely saturated. So it's like if, if it, there is vacuum, basically. And it's only uh, in the most sensitive region. We'll see in a minute why uh, we know it's the most sensitive region. As expected, uh, you can see the drop of the inductance. So it's very, very low inductance for this new Twitter. And the LS50 meta motor saturation for the Twitter is textbook and very rare as designs that achieve such level of performance. So now let's have a look at the mid-range side. I can show you how we can know uh, where is the most sensitive region. It's very simple. We just take the motor. This is LS50 and this is LS50 meta. We just take the motor and we apply a current to the voice call. And this will generate a flux density that is now alternative. That's the flux density, the, the, this dB we want to avoid. We see immediately. Uh, so we have uh, a clear picture of if it works or not. 
So how to reduce this region? First is to have less material around the voice coil. Less material, we drop the inductance immediately so that we don't generate this field. But also massive aluminum rings. And again, as close as possible to the voice coil. Let, let's see what is the theory behind these rings. Yeah, very low flux modulation. So if we have the voice coil, uh, a primary coil, that's a voice coil, and it's um, magnetically coupled to a ring, so it's like a secondary of a transformer. L1 is the self-inductance of the voice coil, and L2 is the self-inductance of the ring. And they are coupled with K, that's a coupling factor. If K is 1, it means 100%. They are uh, basically superposed, and there is a full transfer. And if it's 0, there is no coupling at all. So K is always between 0 and 1. And this is the resistance of the ring. Because the ring is metallic, uh, it can carry the current. And it's, close, it's a closed loop. And with uh, the length of this loop and the cross section, we can determine what is R. And this is basically the theory behind it. At very low frequency, so this is the inductance uh, normalized to L1, so normalized to the coil. At very low frequency, uh, basically we just see the coil. The inductance of the coil is the coil itself. But at very high frequency, it's the coil multiplied by this factor. So what you can see is if K is very close to one, we have no inductance. We are dropping so much. This is a shelving filter that is governed with two uh, frequencies, so for the zero and the poles. And we can see there the poles and zeros. This is the asymptont and the actual behavior. And of course, we want to keep the driver working range uh, in this area where we have very low inductance. So the optimum design is K as close as possible to one. And the resistance as low as possible. You can see the resistance is at the numerator and we want to push these two frequencies to the left and L2 as high as possible because it's at the denominator. And this is what we have in the LS50 with no rings, that's the inductance versus frequency. But when we add rings, you can see the drop. Now the LS50 meta, uh, oh, it's in green, okay? So the LS50 meta is already less than the LS50. The reason is the undercut. We already have less material. But when we have the rings, it's extremely low and start rising at 100 hertz, which is basically the minimum uh, operating range of this speaker. So it's very low and it's, it's very flat. And this is now uh, another issue we have to tackle. Because it's moving, we want to make sure this inductance is kept low, even if we are moving in one direction positive or negative direction. So this is what we get at 200 hertz and 2 kilohertz. We, so, and this is excursion. So when we have a negative excursion, you will see it's always less inductance. And when it's positive, well, positive is less inductance and negative more. The reason is, if we are positive, we have less material around the coil. So that's the reason why we drop the inductance. So we are always have this particular shape. But you can see how flat it is with the LS50 meta. 
is completely flat and it's very low. And it's also the case here at two kilohertz. So it, it means we don't have this modulation with the displacement. So again, we reduce the distortion. And now let's have a look at the crossover. So why do we need a new crossover? New driver, so of course new crossover anyway. Better drivers, fewer components. Fewer components, better components. So we have high quality capacitors, polypropylene, and air core inductance. Why do we want air core inductors? It's exactly what I said before. If mu is uh, constant, L is constant. So this is basically the schematic we have in LS15 meta. It's uh, very simple. Uh, we can see here there is a branch that was as a, that was uh, added because uh, as we drop the inductance, we have a bit more of energy, so we had to reduce a bit the energy of the woofer. But it's not very problematic uh, because you see the, the current through uh, this branch is quite low, so it's it's like if it's invisible from the crossover point of view. Twitter gap resonances, it was introduced in the R series. So without gap, uh, what we have is a quarter of a length resonator and it's uh, create distortion. But if we have a gap damper, uh, the sound is absorbed and we don't have this distortion problem. Uh, you can see clearly the small tips created by the gap. So it is small, but it's audible. And the resonances are everywhere, even if in, in the smallest part. So this is a tangerine waveguide. We can see that at, a, at 12 kilohertz, there is a strong resonance related to this support and uh, this uh, corner here. You can see the exaggerated deformation. So that's why we added ribs and you can see the difference 30 dBs for the resonance when we have no ribs and with ribs. Uh, otherwise it, it will re resonate and it's like if we have a, a third driver. And in the end, we have a superb listening experience. So uh, the direct sound is controlled as you can see in gray, the on axis and early reflections in every direction. So listening window and uh, uh, floor and ceiling and in every direction. So it will be good in almost every uh, environment. And you can see also the DI, so the directivity index, there is no accident and a nice rise. If you want to know more, you can read the Floyd tool um, uh, papers on it. And in the end, lower distortion. So LS50, you can see, and LS50 meta, so it works well. Part two conclusion, so the LS50 Meta is a high performance loudspeaker and probably the best compact bookshelf speaker that is available today. And it's because it's a culmination of many years of KEF innovation and acoustic expertise. So it was a product of the year uh, last year when it was launched in September. And this is the third and last part, the metamatter absorption technology. Now a bit of math. So resonances in enclosure. So this is the case when we have uh, a Twitter. So we have naturally a start of a tube. And of course, if, if there is no box, or if it's a very large box, what we see is quarter of rel wavelength resonator. And we can see clearly the irregularities on the frequency response. But also if we close it, we now have half wavelength resonators. And OK, it's higher in frequency, but we still have the resonances. However, if it's infinitely long, we have an impedance match and we don't see the resonance. 
So we attempted to 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 be close to this ideal in 1967 with the Carlton, and you can see this tube at the back of the midrange, and it's written in the uh, in, in this advert at the time. Uh, a rear of the diaphragm is loaded by 33 inch long pipe tanked with density pa tapered uh, resistive plug of long fiber wool. So it's 80 centimeters, it's very long. And uh, to be honest, it didn't work very well. So did Beethoven write with the Carlton in mind? I'm not sure, but it was an advert uh, back in March 1968. So a better solution is maybe to use a tapered horn. That was in 1940, this patent explaining that if we have a tapered horn at the back of the driver, what we have is a sound absorbing system comprising a tapered horn, and we have no reflection if we have an exponential low. Why exponential, by the way? It's because it was, uh, uh, demonstrated in 1924 that the horn has a minimum reflection when its array expansion is exponential. That's the reason why it's better to use exponential in this particular case. But the problem is obvious and you can see immediately with the sc on screen size. And what was maybe acceptable in 1940 is not acceptable uh, anymore nowadays. Uh, when the market tends to miniaturization. So how can we tackle this problem? We can have, for example, a quarter of wavelength resonator. This is an example with five centimeters uh, tube. So this is the absorption. So one is 100% absorption and zero is total reflection versus frequency. And what you can see is what you can see is um, uh, at the quarter of wavelength uh, resonance, we can have 100% absorption if the tube is empty. But if we add some wadding or polyester or fibrous or, or material just to damp the wave, we, uh, well, the absorption is less actually. And we can see the this is a fundamental and the harmonics as well. So the idea is, can we create a material with an optimized array of empty quarter of wavelength tubes to have this? But we, what we want is to have it broadband and optimally packed uh, minimum space. So we can use what we call a causal optimal acoustic absorber. That's the theory behind it, is maximum absorption in minimum of space. So it was initially developed for electromagnetic waves by Fano uh, in 1950, and then it, were, it was refined by Rosenhoff in 2000. And finally, it was applied to acoustics by Minyang et al. Uh, in this paper, 2017. And this is uh, the impedance we can have from this tube is at the entrance of the tube. So when we have a metamaterial, an, an ideal of metamaterial with an almost infinite number of IQ resonators, we have this impedance. So this is the real part so we rise immediately and we reach one. That means no reflection. And the imaginary part, you can see it's compliance behavior. And one is the cutoff frequency. Of course, it works from a certain frequency, but it's also the case with an exponential horn. What is interesting is to see the absorption this is uh, an infinite number of tubes compared to an infinitely long exponential horn. And you can see the absorption is better for the same cutoff frequency. 
if we use the same volume, physical volume, it is also better to use this metamaterial approach. So that was a concept. And this is now the proof of concept. So this is 16 channels optimally packed in this uh, cube. And you can see the resonances here. But if we have, uh, and we are very close to one, but if we had uh, a sponge, a uh, bit of foam in front of it, what we have is we have, we avoid this drop between the resonances. So in the end, it's not 100%, it's a bit less, 95%, but it's broadband. It, and it's exactly what we want. We want, because we want a uh, perfect absorption, but also we want no ripple, no ripple at all uh, on the frequency response, so it should be flat. And it's what we call uh, absorb, absorption valley uh, filling effect. And it's a, it's a success, so that's why AMG was funded based on this technology. So at KEF, we decided to approach AMG to know what is the best way to incorporate such technology in a loudspeaker. And it was a battle between radial or, or axial. So axial is this one. So this is uh, the UniQ. If, if it's axial, we can have directly the behavior we want because it's directly uh, just at the back of the dome. But we have a number of channels that is limited because we have no space and it's very difficult to fold and it's expensive because it's multiple tools. However, if it's radial, uh, we, we still have this uh, very good behavior but we have no walls, so we have just a guide and no walls here. We can have the number of channels we want. We can adjust everything as we have the volume we want, and it's quite cheap. However, we need to couple with a waveguide between the dome and the absorber. So to have a flat absorption spectrum, we need an equally spaced resonance distribution per active and this is what we have with two layers of 15 tubes you can see at the back of each channel what is the sound pressure so we can see the tuning frequency so this is the longest tube and we have 620 hertz but also we have uh, the first harmonic of this first tube just there so between the two we can deal with the fundamentals only for this all the tubes but of course from this frequency, we have to deal with the existing harmonics. And that's why we use complementary fundamentals to put between um, the, these existing harmonics. And this is what we get, 95% of absorption with only 30 tubes. But the most interesting thing is they are empty. And the question, of course, is how many tubes? So there is a, a compromise. Uh, you, you can see if we have too little number of tubes, we can see clearly the resonance of the different tubes. But if we have too many tubes, we have low Q resonators. Of course, we have to consider in that case, the thermal viscous losses, and it's not uh, very uh, effective anymore. So we have to compromise. And 30 tubes was quite good for this particular application. So this is uh, the metamaterial absorber with two plastic parts, and it's only 11 millimeters thick, so it's very thin. And this is uh, the validation with the impedance tube for this particular uh, uh, product. And we can see the excellent agreement. It's almost as expected. So, so it, it, it works. And now we have the problem of the coupling. That was uh, the last problem. We need two conditions for a good coupling. It should be one parameter horn, so there is no diffraction in the, uh, the horn itself. Uh, basically, it's to have a very nice wavefront. And we don't want a mismatch between the, this waveguide 
earned the absorber. And these are the three candidates. So the plane wave, it's the straight tube. However, it's purely real. And you remember it should be, it should have a compliance behavior. So there is an impedance mismatch. Cylindrical wave, it's absolutely impractical. Spherical wave, the conical duct. So potentially it works. This is the impedance uh, at the entrance of the conical duct. So it is uh, normally uh, a horn is used to expand waves. So we have a throat impedance. And for the distance we use R because it's a, it's a sphere, the wave. So it's a radius of the sphere. But what we can see is uh, there is a positive sign for the imaginary part. That means that it's an inheritance and it's not a complaint. So there is a mismatch. However, if it's used in reverse direction, we have now a compliance behavior. So this is the conical impedance and this is metamaterial impedance. And if we take the limit with a low round series, we can see that they are equivalent if the distance r is equal to the quarter of a wavelength of the cutoff frequency of the metamaterial. So this is explained here. If we have a spherical wave reaching this interface properly designed, in that case, you can see we have exactly the same impedance at high frequency, real part and imaginary part, but it doesn't work at low frequency. So that's why we should be careful to use only this high frequency range. So three times the cutoff frequency of the metameter at least. In our product, this is a conical duct, we use four times, so we are safe. And this is what we get. 99% of absorption from 620 Hertz. And this is compared to an exponential horn. This is what we get. If, even if we put polyester inside, we have ripple due to the horn truncation. Of course, it's not, it's not infinite, it's, it's finite. But if we add polyester, it doesn't help because it's a value finning but okay, but we reduce the peak as well. So that's the conclusion. The metamaterial absorption technology is okay, an array of quarter of wavelengths resonators, but not just this. It is the embodiment of the theoretical maximum absorption in a minimum of space. And it's time for the general conclusion. So the LS50 is one of the most successful loudspeaker of its generation. With the LS50 meter, the legend was reborn with capitalization of eight extra years of engineering. And the cooperation of the latest technologies, including the metamaterial absorption technology, uh, pushes uh, even more the boundaries of what is achievable in a compact loudspeaker. So with the core values, of the LS50, the LS50 meta set once again to benchmark well into the next decade. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sebastian. That was fantastic. Exactly an hour, I think. Amazing. Um, so, yeah, fantastic. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, yes, yeah, so it's a, it's a quite amazing there. I think. Um, I think one of the things that's most most startling is you 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 take you take a speaker what what to the unexpert viewer probably looks like one loudspeaker in a box, and and then you've got so much science of so many different facets of this to actually optimize the thing quite quite staggering, uh, mind blown. 